talking about William Blake's poetry. Today, we have Dr. Ben Lubner and Dr. Robert Bennett, and they're up to something. And I'm gonna let them take it away right now. So, Professor Lubner, welcome. I actually don't know where Professor Bennett is. He's supposed to be here by now, and we're supposed to be trading back and forth in our readings. So um, I assume he'll just get here shortly. And in the meantime, I'll start. This thing's on, right? Yeah. I think he might be closer. That much closer? Yeah. Oh, boy. yeah. Anyways, I'm sorry that uh, Professor Bennett isn't here yet, but I'm just going to go ahead and get started without him, and I hope that he'll uh, show up eventually. The first poem that uh, I want to read, to sort of get things off in a sort of lively fashion, is uh, from Allen Ginsberg's uh, very famous book, How. This poem is titled America. It's uh, mildly political, you might say. Uh, Allen Ginsberg's America. America, I've given you all, and now I'm nothing. America, $2.27, January 17th, 1956. I can't stand my own mind. America. America! Go fuck yourself with your atom bomb! Uh, I don't feel good, don't bother me. I won't write my poem till I'm in my right mind. America, when will you be angelic? When will you take off your clothes? When will you look at yourself through the grave? When will you be worthy of your million Trotskyites? America, why are your libraries full of tears? America, when will you send all of your eggs to India? I'm sick of your insane demands. When can I go into the supermarket and buy what I want with my good looks? America, after all, it is you and I who are perfect, not the next world. Your machinery is too much for me. You made me want to be a saint. There must be some other way to settle this argument. Burroughs is in Tangiers. I don't think he'll come back. It's sinister. Are you being sinister? Is this some form of practical joke? I'm trying to come to the point. I refuse to give up my session. America, stop pushing. I know what I'm doing. America, the plum blossoms are falling. I haven't read the newspapers for months. Every day someone goes on trial for yeah, well, America, I feel sentimental about the Wobblies. America, I used to be a communist when I was a kid. I'm not sorry. I smoke marijuana every chance I get. I sit in my house for days on end and stare at the roses in the closet. When I go to Chinatown, I get drunk and never get laid. My mind is made up. There's going to be trouble. You should have seen me reading Marx. My psychoanalyst thinks I'm perfectly right. I won't say the Lord's Prayer. I have mystical visions and cosmic vibrations. Uh, America, I still haven't told you what you did to Uncle Max after he came home from Russia. America, how can I write a holy litany in your silly mood? I will continue like Harry Ford. My strophes are as individual as his automobiles. More so, they're all different sexes. Uh, America, I will sell you strophes. $2,500 a piece, $500 on your old strophe. America, free Tom Moody. And America saved the Spanish loyalists. America, Sacco and Fancetti must not die. America, I am the Scottsboro Boys. America, when I was seven, Mama took me to communist cell meetings. They sold us garbanzos, a handful per ticket. A ticket cost a nickel, and the speeches were free. Everybody was angelic and sentimental about the workers. It was all so sincere. You have no idea what a good thing the party was in 1835. Scott Deering was a grand old man, a real bench. Mother's roar made me cry. I once saw Israel after play. Everybody must have been a spy. America, you don't really want to go to war. America, it's them bad Russians. Them Russians, them Russians, and them Chinamen, and them Russians. America, this is quite serious. America, this is the impression I get from looking at the television set. America, is this correct? I'd better get right down to the job. It's true. I don't want to join the army or turn laths into precision part factories. I'm nearsighted and psychopathic anyway. America, I'm putting my queer shoulder to the wheel. Woo. 
So he was up there all along. Uh, the next poem I want to read is uh, by a poet named Philip Levine, who was born in the late 1920s in Detroit uh, and grew up in Detroit during the Great Depression. Uh, and this is a poem called What Work Is from a book of the same title. It's about looking for work in one of the auto factories in Detroit uh, growing up during difficult times. What Work Is we stand in the rain in a long line waiting at Ford Highland Park for work. You know what work is. If you're old enough to read this, you know what work is, although you may not do it. But forget you. This is about waiting, shifting from one foot to another, feeling the light rain falling like mist into your hair, blurring your vision, until you think you see your own brother ahead of you, maybe ten places. You rub your glasses with your fingers, and of course it's someone else's brother narrower across the shoulders than yours, but with the same sad slouch, the grin that does not hide the stubbornness, the sad refusal to give in to rain, to the hours of waiting, to the knowledge that somewhere ahead a man is waiting who will say, no, we're not hiring today for any reason he wants. You love your brother. Now, suddenly you can hardly stand the love flooding you for your brother, who's not beside you or behind you ahead, or ahead because he's home trying to sleep off a miserable night at Cadillac so he can get up before noon to study his German. Works eight hours a night so he can sing Wagner, the opera you hate most, the worst music ever invented. How long has it been since you told him you loved him? Held his wide shoulders, opened your eyes wide and said those words, and maybe kissed his cheek. You've never done something so simple, so obvious, not because you're too young or too dumb, not because you're jealous or even mean or incapable of crying, in the presence of another man, no, just because you don't know what work is. We're going to do a little tag team poetry reading here. And uh, a couple of the pieces I'm going to read are poetic manifestos from the period of the 1950s and 1960s, where a lot of poets tried to reinvent American poetry, um, or artists tried to reinvent American art by creating new styles of, of art. And uh, some of these manifestos help explain uh, what these artists thought they were up to. This is Kleis Oldenburg's I Am For An Art. I am for an art that is political, erotical, mystical. I am for an art that does something other than sit on its ass in a museum. I am for an art that grows up not knowing it is art at all, an art given the chance of having a staring point of, a starting point of zero. I am for an art that embroils itself with the everyday crap and still comes out on top. I am for an art that imitates the human, that is comic, if necessary, or violent, or whatever is necessary. I am for an art that takes its form from the lines of life itself and twists and extends and accumulates and spits and drips and is heavy and coarse and blunt and sweet and stupid as life itself. I am for an artist who vanishes, turning up in a white cap painting signs or hallways. I am for an art that comes out of a chimney like black hair and scatters in the sky. I am for an art that spills out of an old man's purse when he is bounced off of passing fender. I am for an art out of a doggy's mouth falling five stories from the roof. I am for the art that a kid licks after peeling away the wrapper. I am for an art that joggles like everyone's knees when the bus traverses an excavation. I am for an art that is smoked like a cigarette, smells like a pair of shoes. I am for an art that flaps like a flag or helps blow noses like a handkerchief. I am for an art that is put on and taken off like pants which develops holes like socks, which is eaten like a piece of pie or abandoned with great contempt like a piece of shit. I am for art covered with bandages. I am for art that limps and rolls and runs and jumps. I am for art that comes in a can or washes up on the shore. I am for art that coils and grunts like a wrestler. I am for art that sheds hair. I am for art you can sit on. I am for art from a pocket with deep channels of the ear from the edge of a knife, from the corners of the mouth, stuck in the eye or worn on the wrists. I am for art under the skirts 
and the art of pinching cockroaches. I am for the art of conversation between the sidewalk and a blind man's metal stick. I am for the art that grows in a pot, that comes down out of the skies at night like lightning, that hides in the clouds and growls. I am for art that is flipped on and off with a switch. I figure that since this is the first day that we've had some really, really nice spring weather, I'd read a poem about spring, if I can find it. This is from a book called Vita Nova, which means New Life, by a poet named Louise Glick. The poem is called Nest. A bird was making its nest in the dream. I watched it closely. In my life I was trying to be a witness, not a theorist. The place you begin doesn't determine the place you end. The bird took what it found, took what it found in the yard, its base materials, nervously scanning the bare yard in early spring, in debris by the south wall pushing a few twigs with its beak. Image of loneliness, the small creature coming up with nothing, then dry twigs carrying one by one the twigs to the hideout, which is all it was then. It took what there was, the available material. Spirit wasn't enough. And when it wove like the first Penelope, but toward a different end, how did it weave? It weaved carefully but hopelessly the few twigs with any suppleness, any flexibility, choosing knees over the brittle, the recalcitrant. Early spring, late desolation. The bird circled the bare yard, making efforts to survive of what remained to it. It had its task to imagine the future, steadily flying around, patiently bearing small twigs to the solitude of the exposed tree in the steady coldness of the outside world. I had nothing to build with. It was winter. I couldn't imagine anything but the past. I couldn't even imagine the past if it came to that. And I didn't know how I came here. Everyone else much farther along. I was back at the beginning at a time in life we can't remember beginnings. The bird collected twigs in the apple tree, relating each addition to existing mass. But when was there suddenly mass? It took what it found after the others were finished. The same materials, why should it matter to be finished last? The same materials, the same limited good, brown twigs, broken and fallen, and in one, a length of yellow wool. Then it was spring and I was inexplicably happy. I knew where I was on Broadway with my bag of groceries, spring fruit in the stores, first cherries at Formaggio, for Scythia beginning. First I was at peace, then I was contented, satisfied, and then flashes of joy and the season changed, for all of us, of course. And as I peered out, my mind grew sharper, and I remember accurately the sequence of my responses, my eyes fixing on each thing from the shelter of the hidden self. First, I love it. Then, I can use it. I'm going to read Bob Kaufman's Heavy Water Blues. And I believe that Bob Kaufman is the single greatest poet of the 20th century who isn't Wallace Stevens. Uh, and if I have time, I may read his poetic manifesto as well. Uh, but I want you to read the, hear the poem first and then try to imagine what his uh, manifesto and definition of poetry might be. The radio, radio is teaching my goldfish jujitsu. I'm in love with the skin diver who, wear, who sleeps underwater. My neighbors are drunken linguists and I speak butterfly. Consolidated Edison is threatening to cut off my brain. The postman keeps putting sex in my mailbox. My mirror died and can't tell if I still reflect. I put my eyes on a diet. My tears are gaining too much weight. I cross the desert in a taxi cab, only to be locked in a pyramid with the face of a dog on my breath. I went to a masquerade disguised as myself, not one of my friends recognized. I dreamed I went to John Mitchell's poetry party in my maiden form brain. Put the silver in the barbecue pit. The Chinese are attacking with nuclear restaurants. 
The radio is teaching my goldfish jujitsu. My old lady has taken up skin diving and sleeps underwater. I am hanging out with a drunken linguist who can speak butterfly and represents the caterpillar industry down in Washington, D.C. I never understand other people's desires and hopes until they coincide with my own. Then we clash. I have definite proof that the culture of the caveman disappeared due to his inability to produce one magazine that could be delivered by a kid on a bicycle. When reading all those thick books on the life of God, it should be noted that they were all written by men. It is perfectly all right to cast the first stone if you have some more in your pocket. Television, America's ultimate relief from the Indian disturbance. I hope that when machines finally take over, they won't build men that break down as soon as they're paid for. I shall refuse to go to the moon unless I'm inoculated against the dangers of indiscriminate love. After riding across the desert in a taxi cab, he discovered himself locked in a pyramid with the face of a dog on his breath. The search for the end of the circle, constant occupation of squares. Why don't they stop throwing symbols? The air is cluttered enough with echoes. Just when I cleaned the manger for the wise men, the shrews from across the street showed up. The voice of the radio shouted, get up, do something to someone. But me and my son laughed in our furnished room. I hate this microphone. This is a poem about a goldfish, too. A little bit different. It's also about a poem about a man who's dying from AIDS. Maggie's taking care of a man who's dying. He's attended to everything, said goodbye to his parents, paid off his credit card. She says, why don't you just run it up to the limit? But he wants everything squared away, no balance owed. Though he misses the pets he's already found a home for. He can't be around dogs or cats, too much risk. He says, I can't have anything. She says, a bowl of goldfish? He says he doesn't want to start with anything and then describes the kind he'd maybe like, how their tails would fan to a gold flaring. They talk about hot jewel tones, gold lacquer. Say, maybe they'll go pick some out, though he can't go much of anywhere. And then abruptly he says, I can't love anything I can't finish. He says it like, it like he's had enough of the whole scintillant world. That what he means is he'll never be satisfied and therefore has established this discipline, a kind of severe rehearsal. That's where they leave it, him looking out the window, her knitting as she does, uh, because she needs to do something. Later, he leaves a message, yes, to the bowl of goldfish, meaning, let me go if I have to in brilliance. In a story I read, a Zen master who preferred his detachment or perfected his detachment from the things of the world remembered at the morning of dying a deer he used to feed in the park and wondered who might care for it and at that instance was reborn in the stunned flesh of a fawn. So, Maggie's friend, is he going out into, into the last loved object of his attention? Fanning the veined translucence of an opulent tail, undulant in some uncapturable curve? Is he bronze chrysanthemums, copper leaf, hurried darting doubloons, ice-colored fins, troubling the water. Mark Doty's brilliance. time for one more poem and then maybe Ben will do a final poem, but uh, in keeping with our theme of poetry and poetic manifestos, I'll read Lawrence Ferlinghetti's I Am Waiting, which is both a poem and a poetic manifesto at the same time. I am waiting for my case to come up, and I am waiting for a rebirth of wonder, and I am waiting for someone to really discover America and wail, and I am waiting for the discovery of some new symbolic western frontier 
And I'm waiting for the American Eagle to really spread its wings and straighten up and fly right. And I am waiting for the age of anxiety to drop dead. And I am waiting for the war to be fought, which will make the world safe for anarchy. And I am waiting for the final withering away of all governments. And I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for the second coming. And I am waiting for a religious revival to sweep through the state of Arizona. And I am waiting for the grapes of wrath to be stored. And I am waiting for them to prove that God is really American. And I am seriously waiting for Billy Graham and Elvis Presley to exchange roles, seriously. And I am waiting to see God on television, piped into church altars, if only they can find the right channel to tune in on. And I am waiting for the Last Supper to be served again with a strange new appetizer. And I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for my number to be called, and I am waiting for the living end. And I am waiting for dad to come home, his pockets full of irradiated silver dollars. And I am waiting for the atomic tests to end. And I am waiting happily for things to get much worse before they improve. And I am waiting for the Salvation Army to take over. And I am waiting for the human crowd to wander off a cliff somewhere, clutching its atomic umbrella. And I am waiting for Ike to act. And I am waiting for the meek to be blessed and inherit the earth without taxes. And I am waiting for forests and animals to reclaim the earth as theirs. And I am waiting for a way to be devised to destroy all nationalisms without killing anybody. And I am waiting for linnets and planets to fall like rain. And I am waiting for lovers and weepers to lie down together again in a new rebirth of wonder. And I am waiting for Tom Swift to grow up and I am waiting for the American boy to take off Beauty's clothes and get on top of her. And I am waiting for Alice in Wonderland to retransmit to me her total dream of innocence. And I am waiting for Child Roland to come to the final darkest tower. And I am waiting for Aphrodite to grow live arms at a final disarmament conference in a new rebirth of wonder. I am waiting to get some intimations of immortality by recollecting my early childhood. And I am waiting for the green mornings to come again, youth's dumb green fields come back again, and I am waiting for some strains of unpremeditated art to shake my typewriter. And I am waiting to write the great indelible poem, and I am waiting for the last careless rapture, and I am perpetually waiting for the fleeting lovers on the Grecian urn to catch each other up at last and embrace. And I am awaiting, perpetually and forever, a renaissance of wonder. Okay, so I guess this will be the last poem of the reading. Thanks, uh, everybody, for coming, uh, and for those of you who are already here for listening, if you were. Uh, and just so everybody knows, tonight at the Bozeman Public Library, uh, from 6.30 to 8.30, Robert and I are going to be giving a talk uh, on poetry. Uh, particularly the poetry of Frank O'Hara and James Schuyler uh, and how their poetry seems to anticipate uh, sort of poetics of texting and twittering and other sorts of new technology. So hope to see you all there. Uh, this is a poem by John Ashbery called The Wrong Kind of Insurance. The Wrong Kind of Insurance. I teach in a high school and see the nurses in some of the hospitals, and if all teachers are like that, maybe I can give you a buzz someday. Maybe we can get together for lunch or coffee or something. The white marble statues in the auditorium are colder to the touch than the rain that falls past the post office inscription about rain or snow or gloom of night, I think, about what these archaic meanings mean that unfurl like a rope ladder down through history to fall at our feet like crocuses. All of our lives is a rebus of little wooden animals painted shy, terrific colors, magnificent and horrible, close together. The message is learned the way light at the edge of a beach in autumn is, er is learned. The seasons are superimposed. In New York we have winter in August as they do in Argentina and Australia. Spring is leafy and cold, autumn pale and dry, and changes build up forever like birds released into the light of an August sky, falling away forever to define the handful of things we know for sure, followed by musical evenings. 
Yes, uh, friends, these clouds pulled along on invisible ropes are, as you have guessed, merely stage machinery. And the funny thing is, it knows we know about it and still wants us to go on believing in what it so unskillfully imitates and wants to be loved not for that but for itself. The murky atmosphere of a park, tattered foliage, wise old tree trunks, rainbow tissue paper wadded clouds down near where the perspective intersects the sunset so we may know we too are somehow impossible, formed of so many different things, too many to make sense to anybody. We straggle on as quotients, hard to combine ingredients, and what continues does so with our participation and consent. Try milk of tears, but it is not the same. The dandelions will have to know why, and your comic dirge routine will be lost on the unfolding sheaves of the wind, a lucky one, though it will carry you too far to some manageable, cold, open shore of sorrows you expected to reach, then leave behind. Thus, friend, this distilled, dispersed musk of moving around, the, pro the product of leaf after transparent leaf, of too many comings and goings, visitors at all hours. Each night is trifoliate, strange to the touch. Thanks again. Thank you, Professors Bennett and Lugner, for helping us to make poetry out loud in the library real and for helping us to celebrate National Poetry Month and National Library Week. Um, if you want more, they're at Bozeman Public Library tonight at 6.30. Thank you.